let's go ahead and get started. So first, uh, welcome to the Sales and Use Tax Compliance for Dummies webinar. Uh, as an introduction, I am David Farr of Guru Solutions, your host for uh, today's webinar. Um, and uh, we are really excited about today's topic and presenter. Um, as a brief aside, um, we'd just like to highlight that the purpose of these webinars are really focused on um, educating the attendees. So hopefully you'll find that there's a lot of great content for you and we want you to walk away uh, learning some things, uh, but potentially with questions and we are certainly here to, to help. Um, throughout the presentation, if you do have questions, uh, you can go ahead and log those uh, right in your uh, interactive panel and I will be moderating that and handing those off to our presenter who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, you know, as, as part of that too, uh, we would like to you know, let everybody know that you know, we're going to be talking about an Avalara book today, uh, but Guru Solutions has also uh, written a book last year um, about scaling up your business with cloud technologies. So uh, if you're a growing business and uh, you're starting to look at topics, you know, like tax compliance and other things, certainly welcome you to reach out to us uh, and ask for a copy of that book uh, or look for it on your Kindle. So again, scaling up your business with uh, cloud technologies. So, so for today's topic, uh, we have Avalara, uh, we have Chris Rossini, who is the regional sales manager, uh, and their company uh, wrote a book last year called Tax Compliance for Dummies. And uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand this off to Chris. Chris, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself and t tell us a little bit about what we're going to be getting into today. Awesome. Thanks, David. And uh, of course, thank everyone for hosting. Uh, thanks, Guru Solutions, for having us and appreciate everyone coming. Uh, as David mentioned, my name is Chris Rossini. Um, I work for uh, Avalara, who is the leader in sales, tax, uh, sales and use tax compliance software solutions. Uh, we are a cloud-based application uh, that can plug into over 450 different e-com and ERP systems. Um, I've been with the company for almost two years. Uh, I do have a background in accounting and finance uh, for over 20 years. Uh, I've worked with a lot of different types of companies, everything from B2B, B2C, uh, small business, mid-market, all the way up through enterprise level. Um, so again, thanks everyone for joining. Hopefully this will be a, a good nugget. So here's kind of the agenda of what we'll talk about today. Uh, first, obviously, what's the big picture? Why does sales tax matter? Um, you know, we'll talk about the intricacies of sales and use tax and how it can affect your business. One of the biggest topics that we'll talk about is nexus. Uh, that's, that's the big question these days with companies is where do I have to remit? Where do I need to collect? There's a lot of question marks around Nexus and with states constantly changing how they deem Nexus. Uh, it, it's a pretty interesting topic. Uh, then we'll talk about product taxability, um, you know, how product is taxed. We'll discuss use tax as it relates to the AP side of things. Uh, we'll talk about your exemption certificates, your resale certificates, your nonprofit certificates, things of that nature. Uh, we'll look at audit planning, pre uh, preparation, and avoidance. We'll look at the problems with how you tax particular services. We'll look at sourcing, which is determining what the bill to or ship to looks like. Uh, and then we'll talk about how to automate the process uh, and try to wrap everything up. Uh, as David mentioned, we'll try to keep this very uh, informal. So if anyone has any questions, by all means, and, and it's relevant to the slides that we're looking at, um, so you know, make sure to, to type those in. And, and David and I have talked that we're just going to kind of answer those as they pop up. So let's jump right into it and discuss why why does sales tax matter? Um, you know, we'll just kind of start at the beginning and, and looking at that, that sales tax helps the state collect their money. It's, it's one of the main sources of a revenue stream that the state has. Uh, there are a number of challenges as it relates to sales and use tax. Uh, everything ranging from should we be using a zip code to determine what the rate needs to be? Should we be using something else? And then looking at how that product should be taxed. Frankly, a lot of companies are on the side of caution. They always charge the highest possible rate that they can in hopes that they don't have to make up the deficiencies. One of the things, one of the ways to look at that is to think you may have a competitive advantage if you're charging the correct sales tax rate. Um, and then we'll look at the cost of doing business as usual. This sales and use tax, unfortunately, is a non-revenue generating activity for the business. You can spend a lot of time and resources on it, but unfortunately, you don't get much return on the, on the investment. So this is an illustration to show, again, why sales tax matters. It's just an illustration to show how a state can come up with their revenue. And you'll notice here on the, on the bullet to the right uh, that when general sales tax and selective state tax are combined, 
the state can constitute 47% of its total revenue based on sales and use tax. So it's a huge revenue stream for states. Uh, it's a huge point of emphasis, obviously, for states to find out how they can gather more. Uh, and it's a huge risk for audit as it relates to companies. Let's talk about some of the challenges that you look at when it comes to state, state sales tax. Uh, it's a statutory requirement. Uh, you're always at risk of an audit. Uh, at, at risk of an audit. So a lot of companies that have quarterly audits or monthly audits that hire an outside firm to come in and do it, uh, you know, states are going to come in and they're going to get really tricky on how they do an audit. Uh, and audits frequently result in back taxes and penalties. So typically an auditor's job for the state is to find money for, for the state. So the chances are they're going to find something in there. It could be little, could be, could be small, could be big. And then it's very manual for a company. Uh, you've got to keep up with all of the changes. You've got to do a lot of research. You've got to, a lot of, to do a lot of investigating. You have to dig on Department of Revenue websites, which can be very tough. There's a lot of room for error. Uh, and then as you may know, and we'll talk about as we go later on in the slide, it's also very expensive. And as I've already mentioned, it's, it's a non-generating, non-revenue generating activity. Uh, so it just, you're dedicating a lot of resources to this particular function. And one thing that we always will say is folks in the accounting department very rarely you're going to get accolades or awards or promotions for doing sales tax correctly. But I can assure you that quite a few folks, uh, folks in the finance department have lost their job for doing it incorrectly. So this kind of slide goes along with it. If you'll notice in the very back of the slide, you're looking at a map of the United States, and you're looking at how difficult this can be to keep up with. There's over 150 million mailing addresses in the U.S. There's 12,000 different jurisdiction, jurisdictional rules. 35,000 sales and use tax rates, 30 million product exemptions, and of course over 750,000 buyer and seller exemptions. So with this magnitude of, of what can come around with sales and use tax, it's no wonder that this can certainly be a challenge for what you're looking at. Next slide I want to go over was given to us by Wakefield Research, and the research was done back in July 2013. It's looking at what is the cost of business. So if you pulled a lot of the mid-market to enterprise level businesses, you can look at and show that over the last six months, 44% of the companies cannot remember the last time they even looked at their sales and use tax processes. A lot of companies will look at, at setting that up if they're going through someone like Guru Solutions and they're just now getting their ERP system set up, that's when some time and dedication is focused on sales and use tax. Frankly, once that's done, they very rarely even look at it. More interesting than that, 48% of businesses believe that if, if an auditor were to come in, it's very likely that they're going to find a mistake. And really, it's hard to quantify what is the cost of that mistake. Could it be a big audit? Could it be a small audit? And if you look at the next like, point here, it states that the average cost of a business going through a sales tax audit is well over $114,000. So if you think about what the cost is to dedicate to do it right on the front end versus what the cost would be if you, quote, unquote, get caught, uh, I think you can see that it would make more sense to try to handle this on the front end than on the back end. Continuing on with Wakefield Research, the next is the amount of time that's spent automating sales and use tax. Now, granted, I get it. You know, a lot of companies are not going to fall by this. This, is, of course, is just an average. But if you look at if you were to stay compliant, if you were to do all of the things necessary to stay compliant, it involves all of these items. The administration of the change, the tax prep and filing, responding to auditor requests, so on and so forth. Typically, a lot of people don't spend a lot of time worrying about taxability changes. They don't spend a lot of time responding to auditors. They really don't spend a lot of time managing customer exemption certificates. They really spend a lot of time with tax return prep and filing. They look at, sometimes they'll look at product taxability and they manage their use tax requirements. So typically companies will do only two of the one, two, three, seven items here that are listed. If you were truly doing everything as it relates to sales and use tax, this is the amount of time on average that companies stated that they would look at. And of course, here you're looking at almost two months of full-time work. If you were to hire an employee to do all of this, you know, it's, it's really going to cost a, a lot less. Continuing on, you're looking at 300 total hours of lost annual to manual workload. I'll go back to the point of saying that it's a non-revenue generating activity. Looking here, you'll see that it's a redirect of accounting resources. Uh, accounting professionals spend 11 hours a week filing sales and tax returns or remaining payments. Uh, it's one of the most labor-intensive uh, functionalities of sales and use tax, and most of the time those returns are yielding zero results. If you don't have a sale in that particular state or jurisdiction for the time period that you're required to file, then you're spending a lot of time filing what's called a zero tax return. 
takes the same amount of time to file a zero tax return than it does to, to file one with actual numbers on it. So just an illustration, again, if you're having to do all of this manually and in input, uh, you could be spending time doing other activities, hopefully revenue generating activities. One of the biggest topics that come up when we talk about sales and use tax, and one of the biggest, the most difficult things for a company to understand is nexus. For those that don't know, nexus is the term used as an obligation for that company to do business in that state. They're required to collect and remit the sales tax from the customers within that state. Typically, uh, if you have physical presence or an employee in a particular state, that's always the given for nexus. We'll go over some other items in just a moment. So we'll talk about what Nexus is, we'll look at the right questions to ask, and then we'll have new rules and Nexus rules that apply to Amazon specifically. Um, I, it's my understanding that, that quite a bit of us, um, we at least buy from Amazon, and you've noticed over the last 24 to, to 36 months that sales tax has now become charged on a lot of your orders. So if you look at understanding Nexus, again, just to reiterate, it describes the connection between the state and the business. Having Nexus allows a state to compel an out-of-state company to register and collect sales or use tax. The out-of-state company must have a physical presence, but that definition is constantly changing. And here's just kind of an illustration of how that works. These are all of the Nexus creating activities, and unfortunately the list grows and changes on a daily basis. We all know the given. If you have a physical presence in the state, such as a building, a warehouse, an office, things of that nature, it's a guarantee that you're going to have Nexus in that office or in that state. If you have an employee, if you have a contractor, if you have some sort of relationship outside of your state and state, that also will typically trigger Nexus. What some companies don't understand, however, is that attending a trade show could be enough to trigger Nexus. Uh, it could be that you have, may have an investor or a board member that's, that's in a different state that could trigger Nexus. Uh, even if you're hosting a particular type of software and the hosting farm or the server farm is located outside of the state, that could be enough to trigger Nexus. So Nexus is a very, very difficult topic to understand and look at. Most companies will hire an accounting firm such as McGladry, EY, someone like that to come in and do a Nexus study for them uh, just to get an idea of what they're looking at. And we'll go back to the original point that states are really looking for new ways to generate that revenue. You'll recall that 47% of the revenue that comes to the state comes from sales and use tax. So states are trying to find more and more reasons to charge Nexus or to claim that a company has Nexus. Uh, not for this topic because I won't bore you with the legalese, but if you'll look up Quill versus North Dakota, uh, it, it, it really shows a really high, high power and very expensive court case that happened between two states to really look at what that means for Nexus, uh, for a Nexus activity. If you have a lot of outside sales, you have independent agents or remote sales force, that also could be enough. And then finally, you're looking at Amazon laws. Um, uh, the Marketplace Fairness Act, which has been through Congress for the last number of years, still hasn't passed, and that's what's protecting most on online retailers from having to charge sell tax. However, one of the new things that came up specifically with Amazon is if you become an FBA seller or a fulfillment by Amazon seller, which essentially means that you're going to be selling your product and make it available as a prime option. So Amazon has 17 warehouses located across the country that they could fulfill your order from ultimately resulting in you having nexus in all 17 of those states. There have been a number of companies, unfortunately, that have failed very expensive audits because they are, uh, they are fulfilled by Amazon uh, and it, it's caused an issue. And you'll notice the last bullet point here states that 11 states have already passed what are called quote unquote Amazon laws, which means that you have next, you're required to charge sales tax in that area because again, it's all boiling back to uh, states needing more revenue. Going back to another slide, you're looking at 70% of accounting professionals, uh, I'm sorry, accounting professionals say that 70% of their companies conduct their sales online, yet 47% remit, remit and file that sales tax to uh, online. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is if an auditor rolls in and finds something wrong, there's quite a bit of uh, room for error when you're looking at Nexus. So let's talk about jurisdictional assignments. Jurisdictional assignments, typically a lot of people think that zip codes are the way to go. Uh, you're close enough. If you give a zip code plus five, you can determine what the sales tax rate is going to be within that particular zip code. But unfortunately, you can have up to a 30% margin of error if zip codes are what you're using. I can show some illustrations to where there are multiple examples in the U.S. to where the same zip code, frankly the same street, can have multiple sales tax jurisdictions. So jurisdictions don't follow zip codes. 
Uh, individual counties and municipalities can level sales tax in addition to the state rates. You have states like Colorado that's a home rule state, which means that the city, the county, and the state all have, could have different sales tax rules and jurisdictional boundaries. So what could be taxable to the state of Colorado may not be taxable to the city of Denver and vice versa. And I'll show a moment how that works. What you'll notice here on the, on the map is it's Greenwood Village, Colorado, exactly the same zip code. A couple of things that I want you to notice is the homes that are shaded, the homes and businesses shaded in red have a particular zip code or have a particular sales tax rate whereas the homes that are not colored do not have a sales, uh, do not fall within a particular sales tax rate. And this delta can be upwards of five, six percent. So you'll notice the line here just runs right next to a building. So this building could have a different sales tax rate than this building will have. And it gets even more complicated. Let's pay attention to these. Seventy-five percent of this one building is in the red. The other twenty-five percent is not. If this were a distribution warehouse, the products that I distribute from this half of the building are going to have a different sales tax rate than what I distribute from this side of the building. You can see that same example here. This jurisdictional boundary runs diagonally right through backyards. We at Avalara have seen multiple companies that have reconfigured their entire warehouse and distribution center simply to get an advantage on what they're charging for sales and use tax. The whole point here is that if you're using zip codes to determine what the sales tax jurisdictional boundary looks like, you could be wrong as upwards of 30%. Are you overcharging your customer or are you undercharging your customer? Either way, there's pros and cons to both. Any questions yet, David? We're good? Yeah, we're good. Um, what, one question, Chris, you know, not, and, and I, I don't think I'm stealing your thunder here, but, but I'm, I'm curious. To me, this seems, uh, a lot of this seems similar to what people were dealing with uh, payroll years ago. It, is that a, a, a similarity that you guys see or, where people are moving away from doing payroll in-house and, and they're moving away from doing taxes? I mean, that's the complexities are getting yep. so high. Absolutely. And it, it's a great correlation and great similarity. You know, if we go back 20 years ago, to your point, you know, 80% of companies, almost 90% of companies 20 years ago were handling their payroll obligations in-house, cutting their own checks, keeping up with all their 940s and 941s. You know, they're all doing it in-house. But of course, now companies like ADP and Paychex roll in that offer a solution to where, hey guys, you don't need to worry about dealing with this anymore. Just automate and outsource all of that out to us and we'll handle it. Fast forward 20 years to today, you're going to see that same 80 to 90 percent that we're handling it in-house, they're now outsourcing it to those companies, ADP and Paychex. Avalara is today where ADP and Paychex were 20 years ago. Not just Avalara, but, but any sales and use tax organization. Companies are, are learning and determining that it's way too complicated to try to keep up with everything internally, and it just makes more sense for them to outsource it uh, to another company. But absolutely, it, it's a perfect similarity to payroll and sales and use tax. Yeah, I mean, they're both, yeah, both as, as a liability, non-generating, revenue-generating activities, and obviously we're seeing a lot of complexity here, but I just wanted to highlight that as I'm watching your 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 presentation here. It seems like the similarities are pretty strong, but no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cue it if I get some more questions. Okay, good, perfect. Hopefully nobody's asleep yet, because I know sales tax is super exciting to talk about. <laughs> so moving on, uh, moving on product taxability, uh, it's just as complicated as zip codes are. Um, I mean, just as complicated. So product taxability, and I'll show you some really ridiculous examples as I go through the presentation. Uh, you know, you may think that a particular item is just deemed as tangible personal property because it's something I can hold physically. That's not the case at all. Um, so as complicated as the sales tax jurisdictional boundaries look like, product taxability can be just as strong. So you're looking at different, different gotchas, right? The rules and rates are going to vary between states. The way that one state taxes a particular service or product is going to be completely different than the way another product can be, can be taxed. And here's an example of, of what you're looking at. Anything in the technology space, SaaS software, hardware, I'm sorry, SaaS, so excuse me, SaaS offerings, hardware offerings, warranty work, Anything related to the technology space, states have not quite figured out how to tax it. Uh, so there's a lot of varying uh, taxability around that, a lot of varying taxability around medical devices and equipment. Foods and beverages are ridiculous. I'll just give you an example. Uh, if you're in the state of New York and you have a bagel shop, if that bagel is sliced, then you, it's subject to sales tax. If the bagel is not sliced, it's not subject to sales tax. 
because those two items are classified. One's classified as an item that you can eat right there on the premises, meaning the slice. The other's considered a grocery item, and those are not subject to sales tax. So if I'm just a small bagel shop in New York City, I've got to understand and learn that I need a different skew for a sliced bagel versus a, a non-sliced bagel. Another ridiculous example around food and beverage is in the state of Colorado. If you go through you know, a fast food restaurant and they hand you a Coke or whatever in the cup, the cup itself is taxable, but the straw and the lid that go on top of the cup, that's not taxable. So again, if I'm a fast food owner, I've got to understand all of that. Clothing and apparel is really, it's a difficult thing to understand, especially if you have nexus obligations in cities like New York, I'm sorry, states like New York, states like Massachusetts, they have particular thresholds, uh, and then new things like dietary supplements and things of that nature are all very difficult. Product taxability, of course, is always changing. Here's an example, a couple examples of what you can look at. I've got a Hershey's bar, that's a taxable item. I've got a Hershey bar without flour, that's an exempt item. The only difference between these two items is flour. Um, so you've got to really look at the ingredients to determine what is and what isn't. Another item that you're looking at are these energy drinks. It's a non-carbonated, it's non-carbonated with supplement label, it's taxable. If it's a non-carbonated, like a Starbucks Frappuccino, then that's exempt because it's non-carbonated. These are the items that can get really, really goofy as it relates to sales and use tax. And when you look at the slide, you're looking at things as simple as a candy bar, an energy drink, and a cup of coffee. If any of the participants or anyone out there is dealing in things, as I mentioned before, like technology or services or warranty work, even freight on items, it's going to be much more complex than what we're looking at here from a product taxability standpoint. I've got an example through the presentation that shows how the same invoice can be taxed differently in, in a couple different states. Going to use tax on the AP side of things, uh, it's a very difficult problem, especially for those that work in the AP side of the house. If a company did not charge you the appropriate sales tax, then you're responsible on your end for handling use tax. Uh, so it can get really, really goofy as it relates there. Uh, and then you've got a couple of different variants. You've got a sales tax, which is an interstate transaction collected by the seller on the gross receipts. You've got a seller's use tax, which is an interstate transaction, which means it happens within the same state. And then you've got the use tax, which is your general uh, purchases of equipment and supplies from out of state. Uh, you take things out of inventory. You take things out for R&D things of that nature as well. Number one reason that people fail audits is because of failure to look at use tax. Uh, so one of the gotchas there that I would take a look at. Second reason that most people fail in a, an audit would be because their exemption certificates are not uh, filed properly or they don't have it correctly. If you have Nexus in a particular state and you fail to collect the sales tax from that particular customer, what, you are required to provide an exemption certificate for that customer to prove why you did not collect it. So if you have Nexus in a state, every single transaction must have one of the two items, either a sales tax calculation done and collected or an exemption certificate on the back end that proves that you, do, uh, that you weren't required to do so. Very difficult to get these from your customer, very difficult to keep up with their correct, to make sure that they're valid and correct. Uh, if they expire or if something needs to happen or change, very difficult to keep up with it. If you have a really good solution in place to manage your exemption certificates, you can manage those electronically. You can send out campaigns. There's just a lot of ways that a software solution can help provide you some ease as it relates to exempt certificates. And I know no one will admit it, but I guarantee you that some of us out there are still using filing cabinets and banker boxes. And that's okay, too. So continuing on, it's, it's, you need to make sure which, which transactions are exempt. Is it a customer-based exemption? Which means that the entity is based, it requires an exemption. Is it, uh, is it a deduction specifically related to the exempt status of the purchaser, or is it a use-based transaction? Uh, that's covering products and services usually, which are used for a particular service. Um, and just make sure that they're valid, right? Don't assume that everything is the same. Some states have an exempt certificate that's going to uh, be expired after 12 months. Some states are going to have an exempt certificate that's going to be valid all the time. You just have to really kind of take a look at everything. So looking at audit planning and, and preparation and avoidance, audits are going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So you just got to make sure you're looking at a couple different things. Always look out what's best for you, obviously. You've got to look out what's best for your business and what's best for you. So it's your job to make sure that you limit that audit risk as much as possible. Uh, Avalier does provide as part of this uh, For Dummies webinar that so you'll get uh, some sort of checklist to show what their gotchas are as an audit uh, as it relates to a sales tax audit. Uh, and the state's finding more sales tax audited by hiring auditors. 
countless stories that I can share offline if anyone's interested about how auditors will pretend to be someone that they're not just to kind of observe the business and, and try to find exactly what's happening. California is uh, hiring 100 new auditors over the next three years. Uh, Idaho is going to hire 48 auditors to stay on as a full-time staff. So they're really, really moving up and ramping up their auditor staff. Here's kind of some common mistakes. Obviously, the number one is failing to file a return, failing to report a sale, taking excessive credits or exclusions on a return, filing returns with errors, return information that doesn't match, so on and so forth. Frankly, if there's anything that you could do incorrect or wrong on your personal income tax report, you're going to have the same type of gotchas that you're looking at on the sales and use tax report. Um, so just obviously things that you guys already know, just making sure that you're dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. And again, it all goes back to how organized are you when it comes to sales and use tax. I get it. Hey, As Chris. a business owner, oh, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I didn't thought. I was yeah. trying to catch you right at the right moment. <laughs> what, <laughs> our, our company... Are, are companies that uh, that have professional audit firms looking at them uh, protected from this, or is, does Avalair provide additional protection beyond what those companies offer? Not really extra protection. It's just a way of organizing everything. Um, if, if you're using a software solution that keeps up with all of the rates and the content and everything on a correct status, you can give them the information that they require in a very neat and organized fashion. And auditors, and audits going to happen. I don't think there's any kind of solution or any type of external or internal resources you can leverage to, pre to prevent you from going through an audit. What really happens is what happens while you're going through that audit. And the more organized and the more robust your actual solution and how the research came to get your calculations, that's what's going to help you get through that audit faster. It's certainly good. The companies that really fail the audit are the ones that don't ever look at sales and use tax until the audit's happening. And at that point, it's too late. So it's the guy that comes in with a shoebox full of receipts versus the guy that has everything organized and accounted for. Exactly. Uh, the yeah. you know the auditor that comes in and sees the shoebox is in your office for at least a week and a half, two weeks. The auditor yeah. that comes in that can just look at a you know at an Excel sheet and an Excel file and look at everything is in there for a couple hours and then they're out of your hair. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So some ways to think about uh, limiting your risk. You know, make sure that you're looking at a Nexus study if you're expanding your company. Make sure you're staying up to date with all of the rates and rules changes. Make sure you're computing your consumer use tax. Uh, be compliant from day one. Guys, that's just a big one for us. It's just a big one. Make sure that you're compliant starting at the beginning, and then it's much easier for you to continue being compliant. Uh, if you get stuck with an audit and you fail that audit and you're hit with a lot of penalties and fees, you know, it's just too late at that point. You're, you're, you're being reactive, uh, proactive. Uh, and then, of course, I'm, I'm a lot biased. Let's automate with technology. Makes all of this a lot easier. Uh, make sure you've got an understanding of your filing part requirements. Calculate calculations that are rooftop accurate. We talked about that with zip codes. Make sure you're understanding your product taxability changes. Make sure you keep good sales records. Everything that we've already talked about. Making sure that you're organized and making sure everything's the way it should be. So moving on to services. Services is a very difficult thing to understand. Some states tax services fully, some states don't tax services at all, and then some states go as granular as to determine what type of service is being performed. Um, so there are definitely auditor red flags. You've got to understand what's exempt and what isn't, and then obviously who carries the burden of proof. So know the differences between tangible personal property, real property services, professional services. States often define taxable services differently, just like we talked about. Remodeling in real-time property, uh, data processing, amusement parks. I mean, you've got a lot of different things here that are taxed commonly uh, that, honestly, people may not understand or, or, or even understand how, how that gets taxed. Telecommunications is being a big one for us now. Uh, tangible personal property, or TPP, is pretty easy. Uh, it's pretty much common. It's what most business owners that don't dedicate a lot of resources to sales and use tax that's exactly what they're charging all of their products and services, right or wrong or indifferent. That's what they're using. Tax on services, again, just to reiterate, it's not so easy. Most states have a general imposition clause imposing a tax on the transfer of TPP for consideration, but very few states have imposed a similar tax on the provisions of services. States identify specific types of services, as I mentioned, that are subject to tax. So tangible personal property is super easy, but services can be broken out into what type of service that you're looking at. 
Uh, all states impose a sex, uh, sales and use tax to impose a tax on some services, but again, they're going to be totally different. This is just a list. States that do not tax many services, you see them listed there on the left. States that do not tax many services, uh, you can see those over there on the right. So if you're a services company, you may want to consider locating to one of those five wonderful states on the right. Too bad Hawaii is one of those that does if you're a service guy. The big thing that we see now in the industry is a bundled transaction. Um, it's an item to where you've got multiple sales tax objects within one single sales price. We see, we see this a lot in the technology sector. Uh, we can see it a lot in, in clothing where you're just packaging a lot of things together, right? It's easier for your customer. It's easier for you to fulfill. But one of the things that can be a got you for you is that you're looking at this bundled item with all of these different individual items within it that could have different uh, sales tax obligations for each one of those. Um, you know, services take a large, larger role. So typically when you're bundling in these types of packages, it's going to be some sort of service involved. If you're selling refrigerators, for example, uh, and part of the package as it comes to refrigerators is that we're going to deliver it for you and we're also going to install it and haul away your old one as part of the package. Well, each of those items are going to get taxed differently depending upon the state. The refrigerator is taxed at tangible personal property. The delivery services are taxed one way. The installation services are taxed a different way. And then the removal of the item is going to be done a, a completely different way. So you could have a big problem with, with bundling those services. And again, it just adds to the layer of complexity with what you're looking at. Another big gotcha and a topic of conversation could be what's the sourcing? Should we use the bill to address or should we use the ship to address to determine what the right calculation can be? And it can get very, very difficult and tricky to look at. Most states are going to be a destination based, which means they're going to charge the sales tax rate based on the location of the end user. But there are several states that may bake it, I'm sorry, that base it on the seller's location. To make things even more complicated, some states like California and Texas have what's called hybrid sourcing, which means depending upon where you are and where the end user is depends on what the sourcing could be. If you're shipping from San Francisco to anywhere else in California, you use the San Francisco sales tax jurisdiction. If you're shipping outside of San Francisco into another location, then you're going to use the destination address instead of the, um, instead of the origin address. So it can get really difficult. So let's tie a bow around all of this. How do we make things easy? Well, you make things easy by automating the process. Just like David alluded to before, you do it because you, it doesn't make you any money and it's just a better spend of your time. Just like with payroll, companies are outsourcing, so you can do the same with sales and use tax. Look at the steps before you automate. I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone participating offline about what that means and how that entails. And I promise you that it will not be a sales pitch. We'll have a conversation around what automation means and determine if it's a good, if it's a good fit for you. We'll look at what the manual, offloading your steps and, and kind of get a of what it looks like. And obviously you're looking at the following things, right? It's going to save you time, save you money, increase your accuracy, mitigate your risk, and make you more compliant. A lot of companies are scared to have an auditor walk in their door. If you're outsourcing it to the correct solution, you can be rest assured that an audit will be, you know, in, in, good, in good shape for you. Some of the things to think about, before, yep, fire away. Is there any uh, difference in risk for public companies or private companies, whether or not they're traded or not traded? I know that there's obviously SOX compliance issues, but is that an indication for companies whether they're at higher or lower risk? Not really. Um, not, not once the, the action's already been taking place. Now, if you're in a company that's trying to go public, there's, got, there's obviously a huge due diligence period, and sales and use tax could be a black eye during that due diligence period. Um, okay. But saying one is more apt for audit risk than others is, is not accurate. I mean, it, they don't care. They're, they yeah. are extremely, um, they don't care. <laughs> they, they'll take yeah. money from whoever they can get. Okay. Thank you. But it, it could be an issue, you know, if you're going through funding, if you're trying to get sold, if you're trying to get purchased, or if you're trying to go public, you know, all of these things are going to come into play and get evaluated. And if you do, so let's say you're a small company that you're not sure today what you want to do, but, you know, three to five years down the road, you think, well, maybe we'll go public or we'll, you know, go for acquisition or whatever that process is. I mean, how far back could you have to correct your records? So technically it's seven years. That's, that's, and, and again, and I, a lot of the things with tax have to do with depends on the state, but as an average, the look back period is around seven years. 
Some states have an infinite look back, like California, and some states like Georgia have three years. Um, Got it. So you could, it just depends on the state and depends on the auditor. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So, you know, just some highlights to look at. You want to estimate your tax leakage. You want to look at what your assessments look like. Look at your interest and penalties. Just get a really good idea of what are you spending on sales and use tax today. Now, the first question would be, are you managing your sales and use tax correctly? Number two, what are you spending to do it? And if you're not doing it correctly, what would the spend be if you were? So here's what can get automated. And again, I'm happy to talk about this more offline to be specific to you. I have a ne the, the next slides after this are going to be specific to NetSuite, so hopefully that will help clear some of this up. But here's what gets automated, right? It's an end-to-end -end type of situation. Everything from the calculation on the front end to the reporting, the returns, and the remitting on the back end, and everything that goes in between. Uh, the old saying is good information in, good information out. So when you're automating this process, you're allowing a company like Avalara or like some of our competitors to maintain all of the content around what is the sales tax jurisdiction, right? Where's the rooftop location of the end user? Should we be charging the rate based on where we shipped it from or where we shipped it to? What is the product that we're shipping? How much was the product? And how many of that item are we shipping out? Those are the items that really are necessary in getting a good sales tax calculation. If you're automating that process, you can ensure that you're getting that content back to your ERP system and invoices in real time. If any changes happen, those changes also happen in real time. You're also outsourcing and automating the way that you maintain your exemption certificate. There's software solutions like the one that Avalara offers that can house everything together. And with an ERP system like NetSuite, which we are one of the, we are the premier sales tax solution within NetSuite, you can have everything right there in the NetSuite console. You can request certificates. Your end user can go fill out a wizard on the website to get a new certificate, and everything is kept up and all of your exposure is monitored right within the NetSuite ERP system. When you're uploading new customers, when you're changing uh, existing customers, all of that information can be found right on the dashboard right within NetSuite. And then finally, remitting and filing the returns on the back end. The most time-consuming and labor-intensive portion of sales and use tax is that exact functionality. With a solution like Avalara, you can log into the dashboard right from NetSuite. You can click a few radio buttons to approve all of the information, and then Avalara is then on the hook for filing and remitting your returns. This, again, is a good analogy to payroll. A lot of payroll companies, they just draw out of your, uh, your, payable, your, uh, uh, your payable account for employees. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. And then they just cut the checks for your employees. Avalara is the same way. You set up a, uh, sales, you set up a sales tax payable account from us, we uh, remit everything out at one time and then remit each of those individuals for you. So if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to talk about NetSuite specifically over the next few slides. Um, I understand that, that most everyone on the call is a NetSuite user. Um, so this is a really good illustration of how the, of how the Avalara system can work specifically within NetSuite. However, keep in mind that Avalara has connections with other ERP systems, such as Epicor, Oracle, Infor, Intact. Also in a number of shopping carts, including Sweetcom, Magento, WooCommerce, BigCommerce. There's a lot of different systems that we connect into. I've been we practice for almost two years my entire time here, so I'm extremely fond of NetSuite. Uh, our connection or our solution is written in Suite Scripts, so it's written in the native language of NetSuite, which allows it to be in, which allows that bundle to be installed right there in the ERP system. Uh, NetSuite itself uses Avalara for its sales and use tax obligations. They are a paying customer of Avalara. So it's a really good integration. It's a really nice solution. Here's some differences between what you get with, the, with Avatax versus the advanced tax module. For those that don't know, the advanced tax module is what comes out of the box with NetSuite. You get tax tables that are provided by Avalara, as a matter of fact. Those come with NetSuite that are required to be uploaded all the time. Here's the problem and the differences between the two. The advanced tax module is going to give you rate data that's based on a zip code. We illustrated before how a zip code could be incorrect in certain parts of the country. The Avatax module is going to use rooftop location to determine the exact location of that end user. Second limitation with the advanced tax module is product taxability. Without doing custom scripting and without writing custom tax rules, 
the advanced tax module can only deem a product taxable or if you have varying taxability, such as a service provider or those in technology or clothing, remember the food examples that I gave for bagels and cups and lids, you have to go physically write specific tax, uh, sorry, specific uh, scripting in NetSuite to handle that taxability. The bad news with all of that is if the state happens to change the way that they tax the item, let's say that New York decides to change and say, well, the sliced bagel is now going to be exempt, the non-sliced bagel is now going to be taxable, then you have to go back in and you have to re-script it. You have to manually keep up with everything. If you're using a solution like Avitax and that bundle within NetSuite, we can maintain all of the product taxability for you in real time. So you never have to go research that and you never have to go back in and write new scripting within the NetSuite ERP. Which leads to the third point, it requires monthly intervention, it requires constant intervention, it requires a lot of work on your part. And frankly, if it's an action that doesn't require me to generate revenue, and if the auditor hasn't got to me yet, it's usually one of the very first things to get swept under the rug. Most companies do not update those tables every month like they should. Most companies do not go back and spend time understanding if their product taxability has changed. Again, they're reactive instead of proactive. Being proactive means that you're outsourcing this functionality to someone else and ensuring that they're on the hook for the compliance, not you. The final point would be against the reporting. It's very difficult to get accurate and good reporting out of the advanced tax module without special scripting and maintenance. With a solution like Avalara built into the bundle, it is a seamless transition for reporting and the audit trail is super easy. We talked about what makes a good audit, what makes a bad audit. Organization is the key there. Shoebox versus no shoebox. Here's an example. And I want to show you what would look like the same, the same three items in an invoice in three different states. I have a big computer, which is fully taxable in the state of California. That's tangible personal property. I have a software license, which in the state of California is a $1,000 line item, but half of it is taxable and half of it is non-taxable. That's how California has decided to tax it. And then I've got freight on the big computer. California does not have a sales tax against freight. So I've got a tangible personal property item or a widget. I've got software on the widget, and I've got the shipping cost for that item. And you've got a lot of different varying taxability against all three. Here's the same thing in Texas. In Texas, the SaaS software is listed first on this invoice, but you'll notice there's a $200 line amount. 40 of it is non-taxable, and 160 of it is taxable. Texas has a law to where it only taxes SaaS at 80%. 20% is non-taxable, 80% is taxable. A big computer is taxed exactly the same way because it's tangible personal property. And the difference on freight on this particular item is that Texas does have a tax against freight, and so it's fully taxable. So I've just shown you in California and Texas the same three items on an invoice, but they are taxed completely differently in the ERP system. If you're using NetSuite, and this should look familiar to most of you, this is a copy of an invoice screen, the tax code function that's normally required to be dropped down and completed when you install the bundle, becomes Avitax. As long as that bundle is installed and Avitax is done correctly, you're going to get the level of granularity that you're looking for to be able to handle this type of invoice. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. So uh, we have a relatively quiet audience um, today, but I, I will mention uh, and ask you a question. I have a... Uh, a client in the um, software industry, and I and I think if I understand what you're saying, um, you know they sell a piece of software with some services, some training attached, and warranty, um, and it's all delivered. You know what, what struck me is you're talking about sourcing, but that's all. It's delivered all around the country via, um, you know, via the web, right? It's software, so it's not like they they don't send floppy disks anymore. Um, sure. I mean that. That to me strikes me as a, a company that um, you know is is in pretty pretty high risk factor in terms of you know taxability errors and somebody that should be really looking closely at a solution like like Avitax. Is that absolutely no? Absolutely. I mean, it, that's a high risk person, um, and it, it's a company that is it, they're doing one of three things. They they've either they're not doing anything. They're the ostrich. They got their head in the sand. They are dedicating a lot of resources to it, and they're hoping that it's right. 
or they're using a solution like Avalira and they know that they're doing it right. Um, right. So, I mean, that's, and there's really not a whole lot of gray area. But that, is, that example you just gave is a high-risk prospect. That is someone that has a lot of exposure out there. And um, and I do you know I do have customers that I know have uh, invested in you know Avalara uh, you know they do have a lot of complexity and I'm curious you know one of one of the things that I found uh, in my conversation with them and actually that's where I got the payroll analogy right was you know it's it's you know for some of these customers it's listen there's things that we're good at and there's things that they're not uh, you, you know is that it, it it allows their team to focus. I mean, you generally, when you hire someone for your finance team, you want to hire intelligent, capable people who are going to be doing, you know, good value-added work. And by investing in this kind of automation, they freed people up who are really talented from doing work that just doesn't add a lot of value. And I would imagine, you know, that that that's a story that you hear over and over. Absolutely, absolutely. And and when they look at when they look at the cost of automation and when they look at the cost of what this type of software solution costs versus what it would cost to bring these talented people in, uh, I mean, it becomes a no-brainer. Um, so absolutely. I mean, you're, you're dedicating great talent to something that doesn't generate revenue. If you've got talented resources within the organization, let them be talented to where it makes you money. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. Right. Yeah, and vice versa. If you don't have talented people, Give them tax work to do. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, right. So, um, so another question I had, uh, you know, I, I would imagine there are a lot of people that will listen to this who are who are on the fence, right? So, um, like any company, you've got to make choices about where you're going to invest your resources. And I would imagine there are some people who would say, uh, you know, yeah, gosh, you know, it's a risk to get an audit, but you know, what am I going to get? A slap on the wrist? Uh, you know, it, it, and you know, I think uh, you may know better than I do, but there's you know, ignorance penalties versus uh, evasion penalties. So, have you? Do you have any advice for you know a small business that's trying to decide whether or not this is a good investment for them? It, be it you know, we've talked a lot about the automation, but you know, what are some of the what are some of the stories? I mean, have you have you heard of companies that have just you know? really gotten hung upside down because uh, of errors that they've made in this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would encourage you to Google Mattress World, uh, which is a, an interesting story out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, you mean, you'll know that, that Oregon does not have a state sales tax, uh, but the state of Washington does. Uh, and just to kind of give you the Reader's Digest version of the story, um, this company was located in Washington shipping product into, into Oregon. So one of the biggest problems that they ran into, I'm sorry, vice versa, I'm sorry, it's backwards. This was a company that was based in Oregon shipping product into Washington. And because Oregon did not charge sales tax, the business owner did not feel it appropriate to charge sales tax to their Washington customers. So obviously customers were coming from Washington into Oregon to buy the product and shipping the product back into Washington. Uh, so a state auditor sat at a Starbucks for a good two weeks just watching trucks go back and forth on a bridge and that's how they got caught. The auditor walked in, pretended to be a customer, um, went through the entire process, asked questions about sales tax, got the answers that they got, showed the business owner the badge, and the company's out of business to the tune of about 20, 30 million bucks. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I, you know, and I imagine that. Well. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, whether that was ignorance or, uh, or, or intentional is probably. Yeah, right. Um, well, yeah. you know, you know, my, my feeling, Chris, is, you know, I, I would imagine there's a lot of individual um, situations here. And again, it's, it seems like we have a quiet audience. If you have a question, I'm still monitoring the, 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 the question uh, section here. Um, but I know uh, your information's up on the screen, Christopher.Rossini at Avalara.com. I know for Avalara uh, that education is a really strong core value for you. So, um, you know, I encourage people to, one, check out your website. There are a lot of great tutorial videos there. Or reach out to, uh, you know, I, I assume people are safe to either reach out to you or do you have another email they should reach out to? No, that no, that's the that's the email. I mean, and I'll make this promise to whomever reaches out to me and, and then talks to me. I, I will not give you a sales pitch unless you ask for one. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you look at. I'll be happy to answer any questions from sales tax as it relates to specifically 
um, and I can answer questions about how the Avalara solution would work for you. Um, we just don't operate that way from a Salesforce standpoint. Um, we want to make sure that we educate you and talk to you about the process. If Avalara is weak, would be a good fit for the business, we'll talk about it. So absolutely, reach out to me, uh, and my vow is uh, you won't get a sales pitch. Yeah, and I can testify if you do any research on the Avalara company uh, from the ground up. You know, their their mission, their goal in life is is to change the way uh, people interact with taxes, and uh, they want to do that through education. So great company, always a pleasure to uh, to interact with you guys. And uh, same thing for us at Guru Solutions. Uh, you know, we're really excited about uh, you know cloud technologies and you know, automating your business and making things more efficient. Avalara is just one uh, partner that uh, we feel does an excellent job of that. We, we want to do all that we can to support them and get them out there. Uh, but if you have questions about them or any other cloud technologies, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us at Guru Solutions, and uh, we'll be happy to talk with you. So thanks again, Chris. Really great to have you on and appreciate your, your time and, and everything that you helped share today. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. I hope someone picked up at least one nugget out of the wonderful world of sales tax. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Right. Take care.